So I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Trent Aguilar. He is a PhD candidate here at the University of Florida in the School of Forest Fisheries and Geomatic Sciences with the Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences program. And he comes to us from University of Arizona where he did his Bachelor's of Science in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And I'm excited to have Trent cap off this um, webinar series with a presentation about some megafauna. We've focused a lot on seagrasses, some fish, some inverts, but here we're going to talk today about turtles and boating and human interactions, which are closely aligned with his research interests. And he's done both modeling and field studies related to this work. So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share. And thank you so much, Trent, for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Savannah. I appreciate the introduction. Um, let me get my screen share going here. All right. Are we, can we see that well? Yep, it's perfect. Thanks. Great. All right. So, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Trenton Aguilar, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Florida in Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. Uh, I'm a student at the Nature Coast Biological Station with Mike and Savannah. I'm also in the Florida Cooperative Research Unit with Dr. Ray Carthy. And I'm really grateful to be able to present my research to you all today. Um, we're going to be talking about some field work that I did over this past year and a half out in the Crystal Bay area near Crystal River and Homosassa, where we took a look at um, observing green turtles and their flight initiation distances, as well as their flight behavior to on oncoming vessels. This work was funded in whole by the Sea Turtle Grants Program, um, the Sea Turtle License Plate Grant, if you all are familiar. And I wanted to give them a quick shout out before we got started. Great. So I'll begin with a quick background on green turtles, colonia mitis, and why are we interested in looking in this type of behavior from this animal. Green turtles are found globally and are listed on the IUCN red list as an endangered species. They vary in size throughout their life cycles from the small hatchlings that some of you may have seen on Florida beaches to their juvenile phase, like the one on the left, which was done in another field study, and then all the way up to their full adult size where that's a large adult green on the right. Um, that was taken by me in the Galapagos Islands when I um, spent some time studying there. They also progress through various habitats as they grow, including the open ocean, coastal waters, seagrass beds, and their nesting beaches. This ontogenetic habitat shift can make conservation efforts quite difficult um, as their different life stages face varying threats such as habitat loss, degradation, uh, and, and habitat loss and degradation, um, pollution, climate change, fisheries bycatch, and vessel stripes, which is what we'll talk about today. So getting right into it, um, a vessel strike occurs when a vessel or a boat, uh, whether it be recreational or commercial, hits and injures or kills an animal with either the keel or the propeller of the boat. Many marine animals around the globe suffer from vessel strikes, including a large number of marine mammals, such as humpback whales, North Atlantic right whales, and manatees. And with human populations continuing to increase, the number of boats on the water will likely also increase, causing vessel strikes to become more and more of a likely occurrence. Vessel strikes on Florida sea turtles specifically have been an issue for many years, and recently researchers have begun to quantify this threat. Dr. Alan Foley released a paper in 2019 titled Characterizing Watercraft-Related Mortality on Sea Turtles in Florida, and these diagrams are from that paper. Um, they found some alarming results with around 11,000 stranded sea turtles um, having been stranded due to vessel strike injuries. The diagram on the right here 
shows how three different species, the loggerhead turtle, the Kemp's Ridley turtle, and the green turtle have had an increase in number of vessel strikes over the years. Um, the map on the left shows where these strikes have been happening for the most part um, on green turtles. Sorry, where they've been happening for green turtles the most. Go to the next slide. There we go. So over the past 30 to 40 years, both the number of vessel strikes on sea turtles and the number of registered boaters in Florida have been increasing at a relatively steady rate. 31% of sea turtles in the state are now attributed, sea turtle strandings in the state are now attributed to vessel strikes, while this rate was published to be at about 18% in the early 90s. This threat is becoming more and more prevalent, and yet the current research has only looked into mature adults and the vessel speeds they can safely manage. Most of the stranding data also comes from uh, large mature adults. And so motivation for this research was to determine whether or not smaller turtles behaviors are the same or if they're allowing them to avoid vessel strikes at higher rates, thus leading to a smaller number of vessel strike related strandings for this smaller size class. Um, this turtle in the photo, we actually um, found and reported out while we are out doing our field work. Um, you can kind of see the carapace there is cracked from what looks like a repeller blade. Um, it also chewed up its front um, flipper there as well. So the goal of our research was to further add some more data to this threat for turtles of varying sizes here in Florida. Our objectives for this project were to first determine whether Florida green turtles reactions to oncoming boats is consistent with international publications and whether or not there was a difference in reaction based on the size of the turtle. Next, we wanted to take a look at the flea behavior of the turtles and determine if there is a relationship between behavior and size or boat speed. Finally, we will be looking at environmental covariates to determine any other relationships that might be impacting flight behavior. Um, the environmental covariates are what I'm currently working on and that will not be a part of this presentation. I wanted to hit on our study site real quick. Um, this work was done off the Gulf Coast of Florida in Citrus County, just north of Homosassa and south of Crystal River. You can see here on the map. Um, this site was chosen for various reasons. It is near two management areas, namely the St. Martin's Marsh Aquatic Preserve and the Chassahowitzka National Wildlife Refuge, and is known to be a habitat for both juvenile and subadult green turtles. With both Crystal River and Homosassa being large recreational fishing and boating communities, this area represents an excellent natural experiment of turtles that have had to deal with many oncoming vessels at varying speeds and conducting various activities. During the intense recreational scallop season, there can be up to 1,000 or 2,000 boats on the water in this area. And the Finally, the uh, pristine water clarity and shallow water depth really made this area perfect for us to be able to observe the sea turtle's behavior and conduct transects in a safe manner. So how we did this work in this area, um, in order to observe the desired turtle behaviors, we set up a predetermined grid in the area using the Garmin GPS base camp program. We split the study site into 36 one kilometer square grid cells. And then prior to each field day, we randomly selected 10 to 20 of them as the starting points for our two kilometer long transects. Each transect was then randomly assigned to speed level. Um, once we arrived at our randomly selected starting point for each transect, we could collect all of the desired environmental data, such as wind speed and direction, water depth, clarity and temperature, sun angle and direction, and cloud cover. 
We would then begin our transect, and once we are up to our assigned speed, we would record the decibel output of the boat's engine to record engine noise as well. So as you can see on the right, um, I've kind of created a diagram there to demonstrate how our observers were set up on the boat. The two light blue circles at the front would be our bow observers. They were responsible for looking directly ahead of the bow and to about 45 degrees either side of the bow in order to record any turtle that was directly on our boat's transect line. The light blue triangle was our captain and he was responsible for safely navigating the boat at the assigned speed on a relatively straight heading for two kilometers. Um, we worked with two local um, fishing charter captains and they were really great. They added a lot of um, local knowledge to this study. So that was really helpful and thanks to them. Um, the dark blue circles towards the stern was the data collector, whose main job was to write down all of the observations from the bow observers and place GPS points for each of our observations. They also kept an eye out for other boats, because like I said, this was a pretty heavily trafficked area. And if a boat crossed our transect within 200 meters, um, we would pause the transect for five minutes in order to avoid turtles fleeing the other boat and construing our findings. When a turtle was spotted on transect, the observer who spotted it would call out the species, its approximate size bin, either less than or greater than 60 centimeters, because that was what we determined would be about the subadult size. So we wanted less than 60 and greater than 60. Its flight initi initiation distance both estimated and using an inclinometer. Um, we, we found the angle at which the flight initiation distance found started, and then we would go back and calculate a um, calculated distance based on that angle. And then they would also measure the type of behavior, it, the type of flea behavior it chose, whether that was fleeing away from the transect line, fleeing across the transect line, fleeing parallel with the transect line or no flea on transect. The top photo is just an example um, of the pretty crystal clear water conditions we normally had on days out. That's a loggerhead turtle. Um, they were really the only ones that would stick around long enough for us to get photos. And the bottom photo is just some of our undergraduate um, research volunteers and they would come out on every trip and help uh, be either observers or data collectors and really made this research possible. So we can kind of get into our preliminary results that we have so far. Um, we were able to conduct over 50 hour or 90 hours of field work, um, completing 76 transects and observing 95 total sea turtles. 78 of those were greens, which is what we used in this analysis. Um, while on transect. We observed a lot more um, turtles than just 95. However, we could only count the ones that while we were on transect as we were doing those two kilometers. There are a lot of turtles in this area if you haven't been out near this way yet. So we will first take a look at the mean flight initiation distance for each speed level. For the overall green data set, we can see there is a decreasing trend in the flight initiation distance as the boat speed increases, which follows published results as well. Um, this trend was consistent across both the small and large size bands for green turtles, which you can see in the right box plot. Um, the flight initiation distance was not dependent on size bin um, for the turtle. So both small and large had about the same results and there is not statistically significant. We're gonna to jump to the next one now. So then we took a look at the flea behavior itself. Um, the table at the top shows all of our significant statistical tests for the data so far. So as I said, um, flight initiation distance for all greens by boat speed was significant. For small greens, it was significant, and large greens is significant. But then, if we did um, flight initiation by boat speed and size bin, size bin was not significant. It was 0.099. Um, but then, we getting back into the flight behavior, 
in the middle cell of that table, flight behavior versus expected, we see that the flight behavior is different than what would be expected under a uniform distribution. And looking at the bar chart on the left, we see that flee, be, oh, flee away behavior is a clear favorite in terms of behavior choice with an oncoming vessel. It's almost to about 40 uh, counts, whereas the rest are um, in the teens or around 10. Now, the bar chart on the right is broken up by speed level, which did not end up being a significant relationship, um, and neither was breaking that behavior up by size bin, which is not shown here with the bar chart. What we ultimately wanted to show was that this with turtles more often than not would choose the safest behavior, which was fleeing away from oncoming vessels um, when they're given the chance to do so. This is important because if greens were not conducting safe flea behavior, if they say we're just not fleeing at all despite the speed, um, then there wouldn't really be anything that management can do to protect against vessel strikes besides closing areas where green turtles were present, which is not the best scenario for management. Um, further study will be done with these responses and the dependence or independence of environmental variables, but that's what we're gonna be working on this summer. So how can we wrap this all up? We have shown that green turtles flight initiation distance decreases as the oncoming boat speeds increase. Whether the turtle is less than or greater than 60 centimeters, uh, it doesn't matter. It's the, their flight initiation distance is not dependent on their size bend. Keep in mind that speeds that we used were still well below planing, um, with our highest speed being 14 kilometers per hour, and that's just below planing speed. This means that at planing, um, which means when a boat gets up on a plane, um, typically most recreational boaters will do this to get out to where they're going. Um, that Turtles at this speed would have less than one meter or so to initiate flight behaviors if this trend keeps up and that decreasing flight initiation distance. And size bin was not significant in our model. Um, however, it was very close with a p-value of 0.099, uh, meaning that with a larger data set and more time out in the field, it may become significant and would warrant further study. Green turtle flight behavior was significantly different than random, and they chose a safe flea behavior much more often than not. And this behavior choice was not dependent on boat speed or turtle size, meaning that despite being a larger turtle or a smaller turtle or whatever speed the boat was going at, those turtles are more often than not choosing a safe behavior to get out of the way if they're given that chance. It would appear that Florida green turtles of varying sizes follow the established trends of flight initiation distance around oncoming vessels and similar arguments can be made for their protection from this threat as international researchers have previously. A very similar study to this was done in the past in Australia um, by Hazel et al. And they only focused on adult turtles, however. So this study now it was able to bring in different size classes to that and allow for a more robust um, conservation and management effort when it comes to vessel strikes. Finally, the environmental variables um, that we recorded at each stop will be explored in order to help us illustrate any further useful relationships with this threat and how it may change based on environmental cues, whether or not turtles are changing their flight initiation distance based on the um, angle of the sun and whether that affects their visual cues or if maybe colder water temperature is affecting their speed. So that might affect the initiation distance or if they're more lethargic and their behavior changes as well. That's something we're gonna be looking into with all the environmental data that we collected. I wanted to say thank you to the Nature Coast Biological Station, the Florida Cooperative Research Unit, the USGS and the Sea Turtle Grants Program, as well as the various undergraduate research volunteers, especially Margaret, without whom this work would not have been possible. Um, I, we have plenty of time for questions, so please feel free to ask whatever's uh, cross your mind, and I, I will try my best to answer them. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Thank you. That was nice and short and sweet. So um, if any of you have questions for uh, Trenton, feel free to unmute and ask them or put them into the chat. And in the meantime, I'm going to just put up our quick little poll. Um, and while people are thinking of their questions, I can ask one about the speed. So, I mean, I, a, a lot of people out there are traveling on plane or, you know, fast planing. And I wonder, um, sort of, are there studies from other areas that have done this sort of work at faster speeds? And what would you expect to happen if you did include a faster speed treatment? So um, as far as my understanding is, there hasn't been um, any like live in water work done at faster speeds just because of the danger that poses to turtles um, because they are more likely to not be able to get out of the way um, given the relationship so far. Um, but there has been some work done on um, like model turtles where they create a shell that has the same characteristics as uh, colonid turtles would and then they would um, strike those turtles at varying speeds past planing and that kind of work was done to see at what point and what type of propeller and what type of propulsion mechanism the boat has and how much damage that would do to the carapace of the turtle so that's the only work I know that's been done at high speeds um, that had very similar results to these studies that about um, I want to say like nine kilometers per hour was when it started to getting to about 50 percent mortality rate as far as like the catastrophic injury on the carapace of the shell. But no live turtles, I don't think so. Okay, that's interesting. So the speeds you chose were determined by what would be allowable in terms of carrying out the study in terms of animal safety. That's interesting. Yeah, it was a big part in this because we obviously didn't want to be studying vessel strikes and going out there and causing a bunch of vessel strikes. So, Okay. Um, all right. So we have a question in the chat. For the turtle to feel the need to flee, it obviously feels threatened in your experience. Is the turtle making the decision to flee and direction to flee based on sight, sound, vibration, et cetera? So sight and sound um, and vibration too, I suppose, are all pretty heavily correlated with um, the boat because as we measured the engine noise of the boat as well, and obviously as you go faster, the engine works harder and it makes more noise. Um, and that would, I would assume, would cause more vibrations in the water as well. So I'm gonna lump those three together. Um, and it's definitely that cue that's giving the turtles um, that like alarm that they need to get out of the way. Um, that just comes from, you know, their behavioral uh, evolution that they are getting out of the way of large predators like sharks and large unknown objects coming at them. That's just kind of a basic, um, like predatory response that most herbivores will have, um, especially turtles because sharks are their main predators. So anything larger than them, they tend to get out of the way. Hope that answers your question and your experience. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it tends to be that they just, they seem to just know whether they're facing the boat or not. They seem to know um, that something's coming at them and they get out of the way. Okay, great. Go ahead, Vicki. I see your hand up. Hey, Trenton. Thanks for, so much for that presentation. It was very informative. Um, I work with recreational boaters a lot because I oversee mm -hmm. the Clean Vessel Act Education and Outreach Program about waste management. Uh, I'm wondering, in your experience, if you've read anything about where vessel strikes are most likely to occur. You mentioned sea turtles have so many different habitats from near shore to offshore. And if there's been any research regarding what habitat types or locations. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Vicki. Um, right now, the research is showing that most vessel strike related injuries are occurring in Southeast Florida, um, where the nesting beaches are. That tends to be um, a very heavily boated area, and it's also some of the highest densities of sea turtles over there, 
as well as adult sea turtles. They tend to hang out um, within one to one and a half kilometers off the shore when it's nesting season, because they'll make multiple nesting runs, both the females and then if males are hanging out in that area too. Um, so that tends to be the like hot spots for vessel strikes in Florida in that southeast, um, like Broward, Palm Beach County, Miami-Dade area. Thank you. Does that answer your question? It does, yes. Right. Okay, great. We have another question in the chat. Did you mention, is there a particular direction they flee left or right or simply dive downward? Uh, thank you. So the flee away um, behavior was, and this was another reason why we chose this field site, was that the water is very shallow. It gets to like maybe two meters tops where we're at. So that's about six feet. So there's not a whole lot of opportunity for them to dive down, which is a big reason why we chose this area. So we could see their behavior more clearly, because sometimes if they're diving downward, it might look like they're not fleeing at all, just from the perspective of the boat. Um, but when we say that they're flying, fleeing away more often than not, imagine there's a straight line in front of the boat. What that means is if they're, if we spot them on the right side of that straight line, they're fleeing to the right away from that straight line. If we see them on the left side of that line, they're fleeing to the left away from that. So away just means away from the center of the boat. If they went across, that means they cross the center of the boat. If they're going parallel, it means they're going with us, like directly away from us on that center line. And those were the, the responses that we measured. Okay, another question as a follow-up about the high stranding and strike counts in Southeast Florida. Is it possible that boat strikes in Citrus County, Nature Coast, Big Bend are not found or not recorded due to predator presence and the rural nature of the coastline? Yeah, Jamie, so you hit it right on the head there. Um, that's pretty much what the consensus is, is that um, there are still a lot of registered boats in that area. Um, and it's, it's there's, I've been out there for about four years now, I've been doing work out in that area and there's a ton of turtles. So it doesn't really add up that there wouldn't be any strikes there. Um, but the stranding data comes from reported strandings. So that means that a either injured turtle or a carcass is found and then reported and then collected and necropsied and so on. So that turtle I used in the slide, actually, we found that turtle out there. Um, it was dead for a while um, and it appeared to have been boat stricken and we reported it. So that can happen on occasion, but those smaller turtles, like you said, predators can get to them. There's a lot of sharks in this area. Um, Smaller turtles also can sink faster because um, there's just less gas in the body, so they might not be getting found as often. And then all of the mangrove and such in that area can make it hard for things to wash up. There's not the pristine beaches in the southeast that are getting turtles washed up on. No problem. Great point. Um, okay, so I, I have another question. Sure. Um, about, I know that I've seen some work in this area that says that there's really high prevalence of the fibropapilloma virus on, in turtles in the nature coast. And I wonder, is there any evidence that having those tumors or having that virus makes them in any way more vulnerable to boat strikes, less likely to flee, anything like that? Yeah, so that's a, uh, a really good point. We tried to take a look at that. Uh, I think we saw maybe two or three turtles with um, tumors out there. And in previous work I've done out in this area um, with some of my peers, we found a lot and they definitely seem to have detriments to their swimming capabilities if they're in the right spot. And then especially if they're over their eyes, it obviously affects their sight. So it can definitely, I would say definitely, it would probably have an effect on their ability to flee from other boats um, or predators in that case. But there wasn't enough data in our analysis to show that their actual flight behavior or flight initiation systems was being changed by the fibropapilloma tumors 
like I said, we only had two or three out of the 78 that we saw. So I know that some folks are out there doing work on that now. Um, so it could be interesting to find out. Great. Well, I'm not seeing any other hands raised or questions in the chat. So one last uh, thank you to you, Trenton, for the presentation. And thank you all for attending. And keep an eye out for a follow-up email from us with a, a survey to ask you about what you'd like to hear about next season of Nature Coast Currents and some other follow-up questions. So with that, I will end the presentation and end the recording. So thank you so much, Trenton. Thanks, Vanna. Thank you.